welcome you to the November 24th meeting of the Joint Commission on Technology and Science. And I'm going to call the commission meeting to order. Uh, for today's agenda, we just have a couple of things going on. We have a presentation today uh, when it comes to uh, data privacy and protection. Uh, we're going to have that presentation uh, first on the agenda. Second on the agenda is we have an update, if you will. Uh, as you all know, we have been uh, in this uh, study uh, when it comes to uh, coastal flooding. So we'll have that presentation after um, our presentation with data privacy and protection. And with that, we'll just simply say that um, uh, just in summary, uh, this issue is an important issue to us, and I'm certainly happy that you all have been agreeable to participate uh, in uh, um, this matter here in the Commonwealth. Uh, it's a growing issue, uh, not only in the Commonwealth, but across the country and internationally, uh, and we're doing all we can to help educate ourselves on the matter, and as a Commonwealth, a state uh, with uh, upwards of somewhat in the ballpark of 70% of the internet traffic flowing through the internet. We want to make, and through the Commonwealth, we want to make sure uh, that we are there to, to help uh, uh, discuss and talk about how we might be able to uh, protect the data and uh, privacy of our citizens here in the Commonwealth. Uh, quite interestingly enough, recently I had to do a uh, speed test, if you will. And once I performed the speed test on my upload and download speeds, um, I was expecting to see at the bottom of the test for it to say uh, that we were in Chesapeake, Virginia, right? And obviously, uh, just as I mentioned before, what came back was to say that the test was conducted in Ashburn, Virginia, which is in Loudoun County, and somewhat confirms what I was saying about the traffic and the flow and where it's flowing when it comes to the internet. So we're looking at certain uh, guiding principles, if you will, uh, when it comes to uh, data privacy and protection. We want to make sure that individuals know that um, certain things are being collected about them and they should have the right um, uh, to know that. They should have the right to um, opt out of situations in which their data is being sold. Uh, if there's data that's incorrect about them, uh, perhaps we'll be discussing whether or not they should have the right to delete, delete that data um, and the like. So um, with that, we have today a presentation and we are so, so, so appreciative for the future data, future of data privacy uh, forum which is an organization, uh, independent organization that has conducted uh, much uh, in the way of research and study uh, on the matter, all things technology, uh, data privacy and protection, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll let them tell you a little bit about themselves uh, more. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Sanderson and Ms. Gray, if you would. Mr. Chair, before we begin, would you like to call the roll? Sure, certainly. I'm sorry, Mr. Clark. Absolutely. Senator Cosgrove? Senator Marsden? I'm here. Senator, Senator Cosgrove is present. Senator Marsden? Yeah. Senator Eben? I'm, I'm here. Dave Marsden's here. Senator Marsden is present. Senator Eben is here. Senator Eben is, is present. Senator Favola? Senator Hashmi? Here. Senator Hashmi is present. Delegate Plum? Here. Delegate Plum is present. Delegate Ayala? Here. Delegate Ayala is present. Delegate Rome? Here. Delegate Rome is present. Delegate Byron? Present. Delegate Byron is present. Delegate Davis? Present. Delegate Davis is present. Delegate Austin. Chair Hayes. Present. Chair Hayes is present. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Clark. And at this time, we will turn it over to. No objection. That motion is. Uh, I will move on and. Privacy form. 
you all would uh, all mute your lines unless uh, you're uh, requesting to speak. So at this time, we'll turn it over to Ms. Sanderson and Ms. Gray. Okay, thank you so much, um, Chairman Hayes. And oh, thank you to the clerk who's gonna pull up some of our slides. So yeah, so so thank you. It's exciting actually to be uh, to be talking to Virginia delegates. Um, I worked briefly in a Virginia law firm before FPF. Many of our colleagues and friends are in, in Virginia, and, and of course, FPF's offices are are just north of you over in Washington D.C. Um, so that's that's pretty cool. And Chairman Hayes, you asked us to talk today in some depth about. U.S. privacy legislation, um, what's going on federally, what's going on in California, Washington, and the EU, specifically to highlight some issues that lawmakers in Virginia might want to be thinking about with respect to privacy. Um, so we we have a lot of content for you. Um, you know, you told us around 40, 45 minutes, but just for the folks on the call, um, happy to stop anytime for questions, happy for this to be conversational too. We don't wanna just, just lecture at you. So a quick word about Future of Privacy Forum if we go to the next slide. Um, we are, as you said, we're an independent nonprofit. We're a 501c3 organization. We focus 100% on issues around consumer privacy, um, especially emerging technologies. Um, so there are a lot of very important privacy issues, for example, in the national security and surveillance and law enforcement space. And it's and it's important to the conversation, but our main focus is on the commercial side, the consumer side. Um, our advisory board consists of academics, scholars, industry leaders. Uh, we're supported through industry support as well as a number of leading foundations, Gates, Robert Wood Johnson, Sloan Foundation, and others. Um, and our primary mission is around convenings, so we convene industry and academics and advocates to work on work on solutions around some of these really difficult questions of data and new technology. Um, so as part of that. Pollyanna Sanderson, who's here with me today, and I lead FPF's work around analyzing legislation um, and creating educational resources for lawmakers like today's presentation. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I find it useful when having these conversations to start off with a little bit of historical context. Won't go too deep into the weeds here, but the concept of information privacy really is uniquely American. Uh, you might be interested to know that President Nixon was the first U.S. president to really squarely address the issue of information privacy. And a lot of the core principles that show up in all of the laws that we're looking at and discussing come back to this very influential report authored in 1973 from a federal agency, which no longer exists, but was the Health Education and Welfare agency. Um, they were tasked to form an advisory committee to create recommendations for the handling of data in computer record keeping systems. Um, so specifically, lawmakers at the time were very concerned about computers, very concerned about federal records, about individuals being kept on computers to administer benefits mostly, um, for example, to veterans or Medicare and Medicaid recipients. Um, so the advisory committee drafted this very influential report in 1973 in which they articulated a code of information practices, sorry, fair information practices, uh, the FIPS, very well known in the privacy community. They were modeling it off of the code of fair labor practices, which had existed for a very long time. And they said, we're gonna apply this to information. Um, and the core principles from this report led directly to the Privacy Act of 1974, which governs federal records as well as to all of these international frameworks. So we saw the 1980 OECD guidelines, the Council of Europe Convention, and the 1995 EU directive that led directly to the general data privacy, uh, the general data protection regulation, the GDPR, which we'll talk about a little bit today. Um, all of it coming back to these core principles articulated in the United States. So on the next slide, um, we often hear, especially when we talk to global audiences in the EU, that the US doesn't have any privacy laws. It's an unregulated, lawless space. Um, but in reality, we have so many privacy laws in the United States that it can be difficult to keep track of all of them. Um, and this is a little bit of an alphabet soup and I, I'm not gonna be going into all of these laws, but this is just to show that what you see here is two things really. 
Um, one, privacy, information privacy included, is a very deeply rooted concept in American uh, history. It dates back even to the very founding of the United States. If you, if you went back farther than 1890, you would find privacy principles, of course, in the US Constitution. Um, and two, privacy laws have emerged over the years in direct response to technological change, especially rapid technological change. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, the primary concern of judges was the rise of cameras. Um, suddenly a picture could be taken of you in your living room through an open window and the rise of telephones. Um, and so privacy was interpreted to be a, a natural law concept that arose in the common law. And we saw the, the four privacy torts. You can uh, sue someone still to this day for invasion of privacy in the common law. Uh, moving into the 1970s and 80s, you see laws concerned like, like we talked about with computerized records, we're worried about credit reports and educational records and the rights of computers uh, influencing the scale of data collection about US individuals. And then moving into the 1990s, what you see is laws emerging for the first time around data collected online. So COPPA, which is our federal law governing data collected from children, was primarily inspired by concerns around children and data being collected from them on the internet. Um, and later on, of course, it was applied to things like mobile devices. Um, you also see the rise of the Federal Trade Commission applying laws that have existed for 100 years around unfair and deceptive trade practices for the first time in the 2000s being applied to privacy. So the FTC has emerged as the lead national enforcer um, of things like privacy policies, which began to exist in the early 2000s. And companies that put one thing in their privacy policy and do another thing and be subject to an FTC enforcement for a deceptive trade practice. So this is only a small sampling. Um, I've only included the consumer privacy laws, not the wide range of surveillance laws and national security laws. Uh, and even among consumer privacy, these are just a few of the leading federal ones. So to move to the next slide, just to sum all of this up, American privacy law is weird. <laughs> Um, this is a quote from Woody Hartzog and Neil Richards from a fantastic paper that I would recommend to the committee if you're interested in learning more called Privacy's Constitutional Moment and the Limits of Data Protection published earlier this year. They argue uh, that the time has come for US to have a comprehensive law and I'll talk about what that means um, and to address some of the, the shortcomings of this kind of patchwork um, uh, sectoral approach. So, so moving on um, to the next one, we to, to, to make this a little more concrete, I, I picked a couple of examples of leading US sectoral laws um, that probably most of the people on this committee will be quite familiar with. Of course, we have HIPAA governing healthcare institutions and medical records, GLBA and the privacy rule under the GLBA is the leading law for financial services. COPPA is our law governing data collected from children and just for fun, I threw in an extra one here, the Video Privacy Protection Act, which is a law that regulates video rental records. The fun story of the Video Privacy Protection Act is that it came into being very quickly within a year after an incident involving uh, Robert Bork, um, a, a nominee for the US Supreme Court. And during his confirmation process, of course, Famously, a reporter got hold of his video rental records. Imagine, you know, like the blockbuster records of the time. And this was outrageous to a lot of federal lawmakers. And there was swiftly a law passed to uh, prohibit that kind of uh, information sharing. However, in each of these cases, you can see clearly that there are analogs in the commercial space that might be equally sensitive and equally concerning to issues of individual privacy and autonomy, but are not regulated in the United States, or at least not regulated with strong high standards like we see under these laws. So even though your medical records are governed by HIPAA, very sensitive health data might be collected by the fitness app on your phone or by wearable devices, right? And there's our issues of real world data uh, it, it influencing um, medical decisions and all of this commercial data is subject only to the broadly applicable consumer privacy protections that we see, for instance, under the FTC. Uh, similarly, 
strong privacy laws for your bank as it pertains to uh, financial services and financial information and transactions. Uh, but we see data brokers uh, frequently working on segments, uh, marketing segments as proxies for financial health, right? Your web browsing history might, might offer a proxy for your financial health. Children under 13 are subject to the very, very strong COPPA law, but data from teenagers uh, who are also a vulnerable subset of the population are not subject to those same strong standards. Um, and then of course, all of this new emerging technology that falls outside of the sectoral space, connected autonomous vehicles, virtual reality, voice assistance, data from mobile apps and web browsing history is not subject to strong data protection laws. So when we're talking about this, what we say is what's needed is a quote, comprehensive law. Um, specifically, the best outcome is probably gonna be a comprehensive baseline national privacy law. In the absence of that, states are getting very involved as you know, right? But what's clearly needed is a comprehensive law. And by comprehensive, we mean laws that apply to the data and are tailored to the sensitivity of the data and not necessarily who holds it or where it came from, right? Data should be treated in a technology neutral way in a sector neutral way. Okay, so this, that's all just background. Um, it, and, and um, and happy to take questions there. Uh, and then I think we'll get a little bit into some of what other states are doing to address this, this need. Um, and the first one is, if we will we'll move right along. I'm conscious of the time. I wanna make sure we have lots of time for questions. So the first major attempt to solve this and what we might consider the first comprehensive privacy law in the United States, of course, was the CCPA. Um, California is the fifth largest global economy, right? So as soon as this passed, it became de facto US law for some reasons that we'll talk about. The CCPA is a fairly limited law. Um, it originally came into being through the efforts of a small team of people being led by a man named Alistair McTaggart, who probably who you may have heard of. Alistair McTaggart is not a privacy uh, lawyer. Um, but is in fact a real estate mogul who became very interested in this topic after, as the lore goes, having a conversation at a cocktail party with a Google engineer about how much data is collected about us. Um, he sponsored and funded a ballot initiative in California that was then turned into a California law in 2018. Uh, it's pretty limited. The, the CCPA has a bundle of, of rights. Um, consumers in or residents in California have the right to request access to their data, to request its deletion, and to request that it not be sold. Uh, the law is enforced primarily by the AG, although there's a limited private right of action for security breaches. Um, it's it, it, you know, it, it came into uh, operationalization in 2020. So businesses have been working up to compliance with the CCPA. And then as soon as this was the law of the land and regulations were starting to be finalized by the Attorney General in California, uh, California residents voted to amend it again, uh, just, just this month. So in November, again, and by ballot initiative, California residents passed the California Privacy Rights Act. Today, I'm just going to talk about California. Polly and I are just going to talk about California, but it's just worth uh, being aware this amendment that passed in November comes into effect in 2023. It closes some loopholes. It's slightly stronger in some ways. Um, and probably most importantly, it creates a whole new privacy agency within the state of California to enforce the law, um, which is yeah, a pretty significant step and, and takes the enforcement and the rulemaking out of the hands of the attorney general. Um, on the next slide, I have a few words about the EU standard. We typically, oops, we went back one. Whoops, we're going back. Sorry, Noah. The next slide should be about the GDPR. Yes, that one, awesome. Um, in, in the world of privacy professionals generally, we tend to think of the GDPR as the gold standard. Um, it, it may or may not be, but it's certainly one of the strongest models that we have globally, um, applying to all EU companies and companies that are targeting um, 
EU residents. Um, and it's worth sort of doing a quick comparison. Uh, we published this report a couple of years ago, comparing the GDPR to the new California law, if you really, really want to go in depth. But the highlights of the GDPR that are, are worth understanding is that um, there are greater individual rights, so access, deletion, correction, but also in the EU, you have the right to object to data processing uh, and have to provide explicit consent for sensitive categories of data to be collected and used. Um, there are also additional obligations on companies. So companies are obligated in the EU uh, to process data in a fair, limited way. They have to comply with principles of purpose limitation. And there are pretty strong limits on profiling and automated decision-making. And one of the ways that the EU governments um, enforce this is through companies undergoing mandatory risk assessments in some scenarios, for instance, when they're doing high risk profiling. Um, probably the biggest difference between the GDPR and every other law, if there's one takeaway, is this first bullet right here, which is that it, in the EU, you are required to have a lawful basis to collect data. So rather than uh, American models, which tend to leave the collection of data fairly open-ended and apply consumer rights on the back end, the right to opt out, the right to delete, the right to access. In the EU, you can't even begin to collect data or process data at all unless you have a lawful basis to do so. And the GDPR gives six lawful bases. I won't go too deep into them. Consent is one of them. You can collect data if you have the consent of the individual person. Uh, but it's not the only one. You can process data in the EU if it's necessary to perform a contract, for instance, or if it's in the public interest, um, or if it's based on a legitimate interest. So that's a pretty big difference between the GDPR and US models. Okay. So that takes us into our next slide, which is about the draft Washington Privacy Act. So the state of Washington hasn't passed a law yet. So you might be thinking, well, why, why are we focused on Washington? Uh, the reason is because it's been a major ongoing effort for a couple of years. Um, specifically, when we talk about Washington, we're thinking of the most recent Senate substitute bill from March of 2020, introduced by Senator Carlisle in Washington. Um, the reason this was a, a fairly big deal is because the drafting of this law is pretty different from California. So it, it's providing kind of a... AHS Betamax of US privacy laws, right? You've got the California model now and you've got a Washington model. Um, specifically, it's more interoperable with GDPR. You see some of the same definitions here in controller, processor, and personal data. Similar bundle of rights. They go a little farther than the CCPA uh, and similarly enforceable by the Washington AG. So, um, those are the laws we're gonna be focused on. They're not the only ones. It, starting around 2019, lots of different states have been introducing comprehensive privacy laws, um, both narrow and comprehensive. We'll talk a little bit later about what other states are doing in this field. But those are sort of our, our models when we're thinking about different, different US laws. We're looking at the EU's GDPR and we're looking at Washington and California. Um, yeah, so it wasn't uh, not my intention to overwhelm with an avalanche of here's all, uh, all the laws, um, but um, I'm going to hand it over to Polly Sanderson for a moment now, who's going to talk about some of the key differences between these three, California, Washington, and uh, the GDPR. And our hope is that uh, we won't overwhelm you with legal terms, but we will hopefully through that comparison, give you some things to think about when you're thinking about a Virginia law. So Polly? Yeah, we'll thanks. take it over with the next slide. All right, that's perfect. Um, so as Stacey's kind of um, stated, I'm gonna kind of run through some key concepts and key definitions that apply to, um, you know, any comprehensive privacy law that you may be thinking of drafting. Um, so here we have um, a table comparing the EU um, GDPR and the CPRA and the um, Washington Privacy Act um, in terms of who can exercise rights and who has obligations. Um, so in California and Washington state, um, 
the, both of these laws um, can be exercised by residents of that state. Um, however, when it comes to who has obligations, um, they generally apply to um, companies doing business in those states. So that's a lot broader than companies that are headquartered in a specific state. Um, and it really increases um, how complex um, privacy laws can be at the state level as um, most digital services are not limited in terms of where they operate, um, data flows across borders. Um, and so this really makes it incredibly important for um, privacy laws to not conflict with one another and for them to be um, interoperable. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, in recent years, there has been a growing consensus on defining personal data very broadly um, as identifiable or um, ident as um, identified or identifiable natural persons. Um, so this would, for instance, exclude um, data collected from a jet engine, but it could include vehicle data or other types of similar data, as long as it relates to an identifiable individual, such as um, an owner of a vehicle, but it wouldn't relate um, to, it wouldn't um, include data that um, really relates to something else. Um, and that distinction can be a little bit fuzzy sometimes, and there can be a real gray area. Um, there's also a um, growing consensus on the distinction between controllers and processors. You see this in the GDPR as well as um, Washington State. Um, and so an example of a processor would be perhaps a um, cloud-based storage company employed by a re retailer. Um, controllers tend to have more direct relationships with the individual um and reflecting like the different natures of the um, relationships processes generally have fewer obligations so um for instance they generally would not be required to um uh, uh, enable um, individuals to exercise individual requests um to exercise their rights um which makes sense in when you think about the fact that they generally do not have such direct relationships with the um, consumers and it could add confusion on the consumer side um, as well as the complexity on the business side. Um, but um, they do, and they can also be more limited in, in what they're allowed to do with the data as service providers to um, controllers. Um, they usually have to abide by a lot more um, restrictions, um, but general obligations such as data security obligations um, would still apply to these, these entities as well. Um, can I please have the next slide? So when you think of information um, that's covered or not covered, um, usually people think of personal information or non-personal information. But in reality, um, information exists on a spectrum of identifiability. Um, now, this is an infographic that FPF um, put together a few years ago. Um, you can find it on our website. We can send it across to you afterwards. Um, and it really shows the, the full spectrum of identifiability from um, explicitly identifiable to um, fully anonymous um, with not readily identifiable data and pseudonymous data in between. Um, and so an example of explicitly identifiable information would be a name or a phone number or a government issued ID. And this data would clearly fall within the scope of a privacy law. Now, on the, at the other end of the spectrum is data that would clearly fall outside of the scope of um, the definition of personal information, um, such as um, census data that 52% um, of DC residents are women. Um, it's aggregated, anonymous, statistical information. But in between these two extremes, um, there is there are a lot of different types of information. So for instance, readily identifiable information um, could include IP addresses and cookies um, and pseudonymous information um, is where a direct identifier such as a name is replaced by a unique artificial um, pseudonym. Um, and so pseudonymous data can often be useful for public um, research and it carries less risks than uh, more identifiable um, information. Now, 
technical experts and also legal experts often disagree about exactly um, how to break up these different categories. And it's reflected in a lot of bills. Um, there's a, a variety of different definitions given. Um, but those specifics kind of matter less than the fact that in general, companies should be incentivized to de-identify data as much as possible. Um, bearing in mind that the more de-identified information is, the more difficult it is to um, comply with consumer requests, um, as compliance with such requests often requires um, verification of identity. Um, and so you've kind of got that tension as well as the tension between um, usability and privacy. Um, can I have the next slide, please? All right. So. Individual rights, such as access, correction, de um, deletion, and portability, um, are often a core part of most privacy laws. And you see this in California, you see it in Washington, and you also see it in the GDPR. Um, however, one thing to note is that too much emphasis on individuals and individual rights can um, sometimes put too much burden on individuals, um, especially in the context of the Internet of Things or um, consent for medical research, where it could lead to consent bias. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So um, many of these obligations, um, these are obligations that apply to companies um, over and above um, the rights exercised by individuals. Um, many of them come from the fair information practice principles that Stacey outlined earlier um, and provide safeguards without putting the burden completely on individuals. Um, so, for example, data minimization is the obligation to collect more data, um, to not collect more data than is necessary for the purpose for which it is collected. So, for instance, if um, if I was providing uh, if I was providing an app um, that it performs the function of a, a, a flashlight, um, perhaps the collection of data, um, location data would not be appropriate in that context. Um, and so by kind of um, moving that burden back towards the company to, um, uh, to, to make those types of decisions, it reduces the burden on individuals who often are unable to understand or read complex privacy policies or to know exactly what companies are doing with their data or what level of information is necessary for them to perform those specific functions. Um, do you have anything to add on this slide, Stacey, before I hand it back to you? No, I think th this is great. Th these are the common ways that uh, privacy, comprehensive privacy laws uh, get out of the, the world of putting all of the burden on consumers through individual rights. The, the individual rights are incredibly important, but they're not enough typically, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, one word maybe about purpose limitation and the duty to avoid secondary uses. It's an incredibly important part of the fair information practices is this concept of not collecting data for one purpose and then using it for another incompatible purpose. So you see that in a lot of laws. Um, a great example is collecting a phone number for two-factor authentication and then using it for marketing, right? But in other contexts, um, you know, there are secondary uses that we want to enable. To companies are typically using their own information, for example, for product development or to detect fraud. Um, and that's why you see these kinds of things showing up in, in ex limited exemptions in privacy laws. Um, another thing, for example, that is a considered a compatible secondary use under the GDPR is scientific research. Um, if it's conducted using pseudonymized data um, that has sufficiently taken into, into account all the privacy risks, genuine scientific research, not just product development, but genuine scientific research for generalizable publicly beneficial knowledge uh, is typically an acceptable secondary use. So, but yeah, this is great. Well, that was um, all that I had from my side of things. Uh, sure. I'll pass it over to Stacey for the next slide. Thanks, Polly. Thanks. Polly worked on a, a full report of this that we published in February, by the way, that's up on our, our website comparing these different laws. So a quick word about other things state and local legislatures are doing. Um, as you can see, comprehensive privacy legislation is really hard. Um, it's almost impossible to do without implicating the national economy because most companies involved in digital services are not operating within just one state anymore. 
uh, even something as simple as a website, right, is going to be collecting information from users all across the United States. So it's really, really challenging. Some other things that state and local legislatures are doing are convening advisory bodies, of course. We've seen some resolutions urging adoption of the federal standard, which we think is also the right, the right approach. We've also seen states looking carefully at law enforcement uses, uses of new technologies. So for instance, a bill passed in the state of Washington last year regulating law enforcement use of facial recognition. Um, we've seen some proposals to raise standards for consumer genetics. Um, California SB 980 is a great example of this. It, it ended up getting uh, vetoed for, uh, I believe, reasons having to do with interfering with COVID-19 public health research and it, it didn't emerge again. Um, so this didn't become law, but it was a really good example of a strong sectoral law that had support from advocates and industry. Um, Michigan voters recently amended their state constitutions. So 10 or so states have explicit rights to privacy in their state constitutions and more states are considering adding it. Um, and we also see states addressing issues of uh, data governance. So we saw a lot of laws introduced and a few passed uh, last year or over the course of this year related specifically to public health uses of COVID-19 mobile apps for contact tracing. Huge deal, right? Um, and another common issue in data governance um, is closing loopholes around federal and state agencies purchasing, uh, ac purchasing or otherwise getting access to commercial data as an end run around warrant requirements. Uh, so I put this example from the Wall Street Journal from earlier this year up here. And um, th this is a good example of companies, I'm sorry, law enforcement entities typically would need to get a warrant based on probable cause um, to collect location histories under the Supreme Court's precedent in Carpenter. But if they can just purchase commercial location data from uh, you know any of the number of vendors that are out there, um, that would be a way to get around it in some cases. And so closing those loopholes, it might be a good focus of attention uh, in upcoming years. So just some examples. Um, turning to the next slide, a, a quick word. This is obviously a major topic of debate in Congress. Um, I love this graphic from the Brookings Institution from, from Camp Carey around what the hard issues are in terms of consensus and complexity. Um, in his view, for example, the uh, low complexity issues that are also highly polarized are preemption and private rights of action. These are the things that are really preventing us so far, at least, from passing a federal comprehensive privacy law, which we're eventually going to need. They're solvable issues, but just still highly, highly polarized. So the two leading proposals in the uh, in Congress right now are proposals from the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee. Um, and you see, of course, uh, Chairman Wicker and leading Republicans introducing a bill that's broadly preemptive of state laws and contains no private right of action. And you see a very similar model from ranking member uh, Cantwell and leading Democrats on the same committee that has no preemption and a strong private right of action. Outside of these two issues, though, the, the optimistic thing is we see a lot of consensus. So that's pretty cool. And we are, we're optimistic um, that the chances are pretty good that we may see a federal privacy law passed in the next few years. So I'll just leave that there and happy to take questions about it if people are interested. Um, on the next slide, I just offered some thoughts about what's next. Uh, it's incredibly important that privacy laws remain uh, fresh, so to speak, that they, they don't become outdated. And you see this through federal rulemaking, for example, because we've got some really hard challenging issues coming up with emerging technologies in the next five years. It's it's not at all looking like it's gonna slow down. So issues for the next five to 10 years are gonna be around virtual and augmented reality. They're gonna be about autonomous vehicles. Um, and we're seeing a, a, a growing concern around dark patterns and digital manipulation and concepts of what do we do about deep fakes, right? Some other things we're starting to see um, are, are focus on algorithmic transparency, algorithmic fairness. And of course, businesses are complying with the new California law where they're starting to look at compliance for 2023 and there's movement towards a federal law. 
I will leave you all with the next slide, which is another quote from Woody Hartzog and Neil Richards from the same paper, which again, I highly recommend reading, uh, which argues that America's privacy bill has come due. Um, Woody and Neil talk about privacy being in a constitutional moment um, and saying we shouldn't squander this moment. We should be very well informed and we should try to do better than the EU and uh, more comprehensive and more innovative in our legal approaches to protect not just data, but people. So I've got my contact information on the next slide and, and we should take some, some questions. Um, and happy to follow up afterwards as well. Mr. Chair. I know that was a lot. My apologies, I was, I was muted there. Uh, someone was seeking to be recognized. Who was that? Uh, uh, Delegate Davis, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, recognize the Delegate Davis and then Delegate Admin is who I saw in the queue. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Stacey, um, and I appreciate the overview on this. Um, obviously, privacy has been at the forefront for quite some time, and obviously, EU kind of threw it there uh, recently over the years. My question is this. Is there a report out on the Im impacts on innovation and technology uh, based on some of these policies? I mean, I know we all kind of get this hot button around privacy. We want to protect this. We want to protect that. But sometimes when you start shoving down on um, protection of privacy and some of this stuff, obviously it runs into hindering innovation, which has other societal goods, right? So what is the implications? Or is there a report on those implications that could occur? Great question. Um, and Polly, maybe you'll think of some resources that I'm, I'm not thinking of. Um, I have seen some reports on the financial impact of the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, you know, it's it's true what you're saying, right? So as soon as you get into comprehensive data privacy legislation, you're impacting the entire economy, right? It, it's impossible not to. Um, what I have heard and seen kind of anecdotally from talking to companies about this is that their biggest concerns around innovation stem from lack of interoper uh, interoperability. They're very concerned about patchworks of state laws, right? Um, they're very concerned about, well, the GDPR says I'm a controller, but under the CCPA, maybe I'm a service provider and I'm not sure. Um, those are the kinds of things that uh, can be really, really challenging. Um, but that said, California has been a leader for a very long time um, in data privacy, passing CalAPA um, and the Shine the Light law for website privacy policies. Um, there's CalEC, but there's, there's there are a number of California specific privacy laws that go farther than the federal standards, which hasn't seemed to prevent all, all of the great innovation coming out of California. So if done right, we think it can actually build trust in digital services. And uh, right now, if you look at some of the Pew research um, around Americans' concern around data privacy, the threats around identity theft, security breaches, and, and uh, companies selling their data and data brokers stops people, at least to a certain extent, from engaging in digital products and services, engaging in online retail, for example, because of their privacy concerns, right? So if you can resolve some of these and raise the bar for everyone, prevent some of the bad actors and some of the really basic things like security, um, you raise the bar for everyone. I think you actually help uh, help the economy in, in some ways. But that said, not an economic expert. We can uh, um, Polly, can I forget? Are there reports on this that we can point the committee to? I actually just wanted to reiterate exactly what you said and give an example. Um, when you look at a lot of people have been talking about contact tracing apps, for example. Um, there's been this is a so you know a arguably socially beneficial technology which has received very, very low adoption in the US specifically. Um, when you look at Europe, such as Germany and Switzerland and Ireland, you've got adoption rates of up to 40%. Um, and you have to ask, why is that not this, the case in the US? A lot of people are citing the fact that there is a lack of privacy. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to say was, um, in terms of global impacts and the US's position um, to influence privacy policy on the global scale, um, 
at recent um, Senate Commerce um, hearings, like different um, organizations and um, prior um, FTC um, commissioners have been stating that the lack of a coherent um, policy um, in the US on privacy could actually really hold back um, the US long term internationally. So those are the only two things I just wanted to add to that. Okay. Um, chair recognizes Senator Evan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had a question about deep fakes. Uh, in Virginia, we have a law uh, against deep fakes for um, of like pornographic images. I don't know if everyone knows what they are, but if you have a Facebook page or any or any digital images, they can uh, easily manipulate realistic videos uh, of, of people doing things that they didn't do or didn't want to do publicly or have broadcasts, that sort of thing. But now we're seeing deep fakes of uh, politicians and other people saying things that they would never say. And I was wondering if any states have attempted to uh, tackle that. Mm, there, well, there's. it's obviously a serious issue. We've seen a lot of academic scholarship about it. I don't know that I've seen specific state legal proposals, Polly. Um, none are springing to my mind except for the, um, at the federal level. Um, the two leading proposals from Cantwell and, and Wicker both contain provisions on deep fakes. So I would, um, I would urge you to have a look at those as well. Thank you. Yeah, and the leading academic that I would point you to if folks are interested in deep fakes and relatedly this sort of umbrella issue of sexual privacy and intimate images and videos is Professor Danielle Citron. How do you spell that last name? Citron is S-I-T-R-O-N. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chair recognizes Senator Fabola and then in the queue we have Delegate Rome. Thank you. Um, I guess this is related a little bit to Senator Evans' question. Um, and I apologize, I missed the first five minutes of your presentation, but I, I heard the rest. How, would, how do privacy laws actually govern social media? <laughs> and because um, that seems to be the evolving uh, modem of communication now, especially for younger people. And there are all kinds of things are going up on social media. Yeah. Uh, about you know themselves, about other people. I mean, so how? Where's the intersection on on social media? And um... yeah, well, um, it, it's funny. Social media is a big part of why we're even having this conversation in the United States. Yes, sorry, Dave uh, Barry Citron, University of Maryland. I believe she's at Boston University, University of Boston, Boston University, Boston University. Yeah. 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 Um, now, sorry I, about that. She used to be at Maryland when I was there. Yes, yes. Recent, recently right. moved to Boston. Um, lucky for Boston. Um, sorry. Question: Social media. Uh, yeah. So Cambridge Analytica was really a, a fire-starting event in the U.S. in 2016, right after the election. This issue of data collected by third parties through the Facebook platform really sparked an incredible amount of concern, and I think raised awareness for people or a lot of people for the first time of just how much data is out there. Um, social media companies are covered by comprehensive privacy laws, uh, the same as others. I think compared to other digital services out there, social media companies have a direct relationship with the consumer, right? You, you sign up for an account, you yeah. see the information there and through Facebook and Twitter and other social media platforms, you can request a copy of your data, you can delete your account and so forth. Um, the way, you know, the way that laws operate on social media companies is pretty limited in the United States when those laws are limited just to access deletion um, and opt out of sale. So for instance, many social media companies would say that they do not sell data. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the provisions of the CCPA, or the main provision of CCPA, just doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. So Facebook, just to take an example, um, monetizes data by allowing advertisers to place advertisements on their platform uh, based on user data. So I want to reach you know, women aged 30 to 40. Um, 
and I can place that ad and pay for it. Uh, but they would say, but we don't share the individual data with the advertiser. We just enable that uh, ad to be placed. And so we're not selling. Um, it gets into a lot of legal nuance, but that's the, that's the basic provision. And so for me, what that highlights is that comprehensive laws really have to go farther than the CCPA. They have to provide yeah. baseline obligations on companies to minimize their data collection from elsewhere, uh, to not collect more than what's needed, to not reuse data for additional unexpected purposes. And without those, you don't have much effect on social media companies beyond the sort of the basic access deletion rights. I mean, sorry. Helpful. Thank you. Yeah. I would just add to that, that um, in order to kind of get over that loophole for opt out of sales, um, another approach which has been suggested by Washington State is to kind of expand that opt out for also targeted ads specifically and to profiling. So an individual would have the right to opt out for profiling or opt out for targeted ads. Um, and uh, I think this another aspect of um, of social media companies um, that is relevant is the definition of publicly available information. So I'm sure you've probably heard about the controversy with Clearview AI, which has been scraping um, images posted by individuals online in order to, to feed a facial recognition system. Now, depending on how publicly available information is defined, um, all of that information could be completely outside of the scope of a, a privacy law. Um, and so those types of practices would be allowed to continue. But um, if, you, if that's not your intention, then um, defining publicly available information as information made available from government records, which is, um, is probably more appropriate, which is um, what a lot of um, the proposals are doing. But then others are saying that a Others, others define publicly available information as, um, you know, information shared widely online. I don't have the specific quote, but um, yeah. yeah. It's a good point. U.S. laws are, are typically responding to First Amendment concerns with those, but it, it can create a, a major um, avenue, loophole, so to speak, in some cases, you know. Anyway. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Chair recognizes Delegate Danica Rome. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, first, I just have a comment and then I'll, I kind of, I'll lead into a question. So um, throughout most of my 20s, um, I loved going overseas to Europe, especially. Um, and like my band toured there in 2012, going through Scotland, Northern Ireland, and such. And been to Germany, you know, uh, Italy, Finland, Denmark, uh, France, you name it. Like I, I, it's just a huge part of, you know, how I spent a lot of my 20s. I'm 36 now. <laughs> but one of the things I noticed when I was over there in more recent years is if I was um, trying to like when I'm overseas and I want to look at my hometown newspaper website, the websites would actually be blocked. I would not be able to view them from there. And the warning thing that would come up was basically something along the lines of like, um, because of privacy, whatever, you know, European nation, uh, this website is not available to European nation states or to are under, or like when I was in Finland or like, you know, under like finish law, whatever it was. And that got me really thinking in here. It's like, if I'm looking at data privacy um, nationwide, right? Or, you know, tr trying to affect hundreds of millions of people, you wouldn't expect in Europe that the German state of Schleswig-Holstein, where I've been five times, <laughs> is going to have a different data privacy protection law than Germany would as the whole versus where the EU would even larger than that. And so I guess I want to really reinforce the message that you all have here about having this comprehensive national identification here in terms of here's how we are going to collectively deal with this, because otherwise you can just default to whatever California wants to do, right? And say like, well, because it's most likely that because they're going to have to go through uh, California, they're going to have to go through whatever, that they're going to want to apply a similar standard nationwide. Whereas the reality is that's not guaranteed. You're going to have bad actors and you're going to have people who will simply, you know, try to find the path of least resistance, which may or may not be in uh, compliance with California's law. So I guess my question then becomes, that as Virginia considers how we need to amend the code, and we clearly do, there's no question that we should, should we be doing this in a way that sets a precedent 
for the federal government to follow? Or should we be doing this in tandem with the federal government so that there are very large macro things that the federal government are, is going to need to take care of? And then at the state level, we're going to be in charge of implementation. A great example of that, for example, it's like the Wayfarer provision, right? The Wayfarer uh, lawsuit um, over sales tax. That is a case where you have, here's what happened at the federal level, and here's the direct impact that it has on the states and our bottom line that we see in terms of our sales tax revenue. So I guess um, whoever would like to take a stab at that, you know, like, please feel free to, um, you know, to just uh, let me know your thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, so to delegate Ron's point, um, ultimately, we, 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 I believe that uh, some type of federal uh, legislation and approach uh, would be good. The question is, though, when will that happen? And so with the absence of that, um, again, here in the Commonwealth, how will we deal with the protection of the data which belongs to those within you know, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so uh, until there's something at a federal level, then I think it's important for us to kind of have, uh, you know, a Virginia privacy piece of legislation to kind of address those concerns um, for the immediate time. Anybody have any follow-up questions, comments in that regard? Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Delegate Byron. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I have a question. Um, several, there were several indications you were talking about distinctions um, and exemptions, but they were pretty broad. Um, have there been any distinctions between small business and large business when you've addressed some of the laws? Um, I mean, when we think of some of our small business, it's very difficult for them to have the resources that large businesses have. And while privacy is just as important, there's other people that automatically will come up with a legal form that someone has to accept before they even move any further on somebody's, you know, website, social media, or, you know, any, anything dealing with their business. So if you could address that, that would be great. Uh, happy to. Yeah. And then I'll, I'd definitely like to circle back to Delegate Rom's question, because um, I think he cut right to the heart of the most important issue. Um, but first on, on the sort of the, because this is a more narrow thing, um, small business exemptions. Yes, uh, we definitely see them. Um, they're typically limited. Um, the concept of small businesses in privacy is a little bit of a challenging one because you can have a very small business collecting a massive amount of data, right? So it's, you could have five employees at a company, but be impacting the privacy of the, the rest of the United States, you know, hundreds and millions of data points. Um, so I've seen analogs, you know, comparisons made to environmental pollution, right? Where you could have a very small company having a major impact. Um, uh, that said, there are some things that are more or less useful for small businesses who are particularly usually concerned about enforcement. Um, so we see things like uh, safe harbors in the online children's privacy context are, I'm told, very useful for small businesses um, to have a set of standards to look to and, and just follow. Um, and where we do see the exemptions, like under California, for example, Companies are not regulated if they're processing fewer than 100, sorry, what is it, 100 million, I think, consumers, data from 100 million consumers, 50% uh, or, or less of their revenue, and they tie it to revenue. Yeah, there are different thresholds, um, depending on kind of different factors, such as revenue, data collection, and size of the business. And then um, the, re the thresholds would be lower if, you have, if you're collecting sensitive data. Yeah. I was just going to mention, that of data breach used some similar models when you were dealing with uh, breaches. It, it went after the quantity um, of the data. Is that how some of those are approaching it? That, that can be very helpful, kind of tailoring based on quantity and sensitivity. So even a very small amount of very highly sensitive data should probably be subject to protections, right? Um, also, what I'm told, again, it's kind of uh, anecdotally, is when you define data so broadly, um, so it can include IP addresses and cookie IDs, right? 
it's very easy to meet that hundred million um, threshold. Just very, very just a regular website, you know, with daily traffic numbers being quite high, might collect that amount of information, when, you know, in a day or a week or a month. Yeah. I would say that Washington State's been grappling with this, um, and in their kind of third, fourth, fifth iteration, um, they've kind of come up with a kind of nuanced um, threshold um, related um, approach. And so I would direct you towards um, the latest version of, of their, their bill as well. So Delegate Rome, though, I, I really appreciated your comments and your question. Um, some of the experience, I, similarly, we, you know, we've traveled and done privacy events in the Europe, and I, it's always interesting to look at visiting US websites, especially news publishers, and seeing either it's blocked completely or they've got these major click through uh, cookie banners where you have to hit I accept for every little thing. Um, a lot of that actually doesn't come from the GDPR. Sometimes it comes from the um, e-privacy directive, which regulates cookies and placing data on someone's device, um, which requires consent in the EU. And, and, and that's challenging to do. What I've noticed is a lot of companies in the United States, if they haven't yet operated outside of the United States, and they haven't yet been subject to any federal sectoral law, they just don't know what they don't know. And so it's easier to just cut off EU audiences in some cases than deal with the complexity of international data protection law. Um, so we saw that uh, in particular right after the GDPR came into effect in 2016. So, so certain companies either, either withdrew um, or or blocked access, and then it started to reverse over time. So companies are getting more comfortable with those laws and regulations. Um, and I think, you know, once the United States is in the game with a federal comprehensive law, some of those concerns, um, some of those concerns start to go away, streamline things a little bit more. But the interoperability, I mean, it, not just between US states, but between nations is, is such, a, such an important issue, which is why there does need to be a federal standard at the end of the day. Um, what we've said to federal lawmakers, though, with respect to just having a federal standard and preempting all state efforts whatsoever, is that very, very broad preemption is probably not the right answer either. You need to preempt state laws to a certain extent to have a uniform national standard um, around things like how data is defined and what requires consent and how to get it and um, you know how to do access requests. But you can't preempt everything because you're always going to have state tort and contract law. You're always going to have state analogs to existing sectors. So financial, our financial laws are not preemptive. And so Virginia and other states have additional financial sector privacy laws. Um, there are always going to be privacy laws around state-specific law enforcement, government, schools, educational records, online learning, all these things um, are always going to be a matter primarily of state concerns. So it's a question of setting federal standards and making sure that the federal government takes an active role there, um, but leaving, leaving room for the things that are correctly within state control. It tends not to be an either or. I don't know if that's answering your question. <laughs> I think it's very, very complicated. And hard, and that's why this is so challenging, and uh, we haven't passed a law yet. So, uh, Ms. Gray, Ms. Sanderson, uh, if you could touch on uh, one area, obviously, um, it's it's always good for us to have legislation in, in in any aspect, right? But what I believe becomes, you know, the effective piece. Um, behind legislation is the enforcement. And so in this conversation, as we're talking here, if we make those uh, comparisons to, uh, say, for instance, the Washington state law with the enforcement, I believe, of the attorney general's office, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't want to talk too much through it, but the fact that, they, that the attorney general's office usually can follow trends in bad actors uh, um, and has more of a comprehensive look at the companies across the Commonwealth. Uh, if you could touch on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah we, we had a comparison slide for that and we took it out to, to not, <laughs> just for brevity. Um, but, but yeah, it's 
Interesting. So the Washington privacy bills have placed enforcement with the Washington Attorney General. Um, there was some dispute about that. I think advocates would have preferred individuals be able to challenge violations in court through a private right of action. Um, private right of actions can be very difficult in the privacy space because we're talking in some cases about intangible harms that are difficult to quantify, right? Um, and, and there's so much need for ongoing guidance, right? So um, agency guidance probably is appropriate for a large bulk of, of what we're talking about. And then the question is how to, how to bolster it, how to make sure it's strong enough, right? Uh, even the best written privacy law without meaningful enforcement gets you nothing, right? There, it has to have meaningful enforcement in order for it to be a meaningful law. Um, so when you're thinking about enforcement, think about funding, how the agency will be funded, how it will continue to get funding. Think about expertise. So the Federal Trade Commission has longstanding expertise. They've been enforcing privacy policies since the early 2000s, right? And a wide variety of very uh, impactful privacy-related cases, consent decree against Facebook, like Equifax. FTC has been very strong on this as a government body. Um, but they also have an office of uh, technological research. So they hire not just lawyers, but data scientists, right? People to, to really evaluate the technical side of things because it gets so technologically complex. Um, so Washington was the AG. California similarly has housed most of its uh, enforcement authority under the office of the attorney general. CCPA actually has a limited private right of action just for security breaches. So if your data has been exposed in a massive security breach, you can challenge that directly in court. But for other things like access requests and deletion requests, you see AG enforcement. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty complex. What can I add to that? You know, it, what, one thing that we've really been trying to do both federally and at the states is kind of break out of this polarization. We see a lot of dispute between industry and advocates of either it's got a private right of action or it doesn't have a private right of, act, right of action or it's either government or it's civil. Um, in reality, there are a lot of things you can do in between to bolster enforcement without necessarily going down the road of uh, open-ended class action litigation, right? If that's a concern. Um, so one of those things, for instance, is internal, internal appeals. So the Washington bill would have required companies to establish internal appeals programs um, right to cure periods can also be useful. So this is something that California had until recently. Uh, companies had a 30-day right to cure after they were approached by the AG with an enforcement action. That's, uh, that's a pretty useful thing internally if you're working at a company because it gives you a timeline. We, we ha ha you can say to the rest of the company, if you're, for instance, if you're a chief privacy officer, okay, the AG has identified this violation. We have 30 days to fix it. So we better fix it. So that's been uh, pretty useful. And um, the AG has already sent out, according to them, a whole wide swath of enforcement letters to companies in California, giving them a chance to come into compliance. And what they've said is most have come into compliance. So very, very useful without opening up a whole investigation. Um, there's some, some basics around enforcement. Did I miss anything, Polly? I have nothing to add on that. Yeah. Mr. Chairman? Uh, chair recognizes uh, Delegate Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, quick question, and Stacey, here, probably, I don't know if you've run into this, and I know, you know, Washington's still playing with legislation and California's still relatively new. Um, but when we talk about the right to cure and accurate data, I think all of us can get behind that. When it comes to what is allowable usable data, what isn't, mm -hmm. and you look at the space of innovation and technology, are there conversations going on? Is there things we already are seeing where um, uh, tech companies are, are looking at just moving uh, to a state. I mean, honestly, if, if so we have uh, companies in Virginia that do their, they do innovation and facial recognition. And if I'm one of them, I, I'm moving to North Carolina tomorrow. If, if we drop a bill on in January, I mean, whether we agree or disagree on what should be the law, um, have you looked at what happens when the state starts doing a patchwork and a patch kind of quilt of, of laws and kind of how it just kind of shovels the deck chairs around is, are there conversations on the West coast going on about that right now? It's a good question, particularly for smaller States, right? Because it, it might not be feasible to move out of California, but maybe right, like right. you said, maybe move 
North Carolina. Um, I haven't seen much of that, but but it's partly because we don't we don't have the laws yet, right? Yeah. But two of the big epicenters of innovation and new technology are California and Washington, being the the home of uh, Microsoft, right, um, and Amazon, I believe, right. Even though they also have a headquarters here in Virginia, um, so th you know those those are pretty major. One thing that might be interesting to look into is um, Illinois and what happened after they passed the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act or BIPA. Um, so BIPA was passed actually kind of a long time ago at this point, I think it was around 2007, 2008. I, I might be wrong on that, but like before sort of all of this started. So it's been around for a little while and it's very strong law, uh, requires affirmative consent for collection of biometric information, so facial recognition, right? Um, and what we've seen in some limited cases is companies uh, not extending services to Illinois. So not so much a question of moving physically out of the state, but more a question of where are my services targeted? And if possible, can I geofence out the state and just not collect data? Kind of like how Delegate Rome was describing, like if you come in from a certain state based on the IP address or certain country, um, most websites and online services can can tell based on your IP address roughly where you're located uh, and, and cut off services. Um, so I haven't seen a lot of that, but certainly it's a concern. It exists. Thank you. So Senator Favola, did I see your hand? Oh, she's fine. Okay, any other questions? Okay, uh, Chair recognizes Ms. Nancy Libby. Th yeah. thank, thank you very much. Um, just a quick question for Stacy. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, what states have done and of course what Europe did. Um, we also know that the Federal Trade Commission back in 2012 spent a couple of years looking very closely at privacy and talking to a wide range of stakeholders before developing its privacy framework. If you could just talk a little bit about the, the process that the most successful processes, it seems like the most successful ones were those like the FTC, which took a long time, but got it right and developed a framework that a lot of companies have adopted and used as opposed to California, which really stumbled out of the gate and has been amending its law and trying to fix it because it moves so quickly. Mm -hmm. Is that how, it, could you talk about how you see it? That's that's I, I, that's a good characterization. I, I mean, some of it in California, some of the confusion, it really boils down to just a very simple issue of the law is confusingly written. It's just drafted in a way that's hard. You know, just the terms business and service provider instead of controller and processor, right? Um, and and that's because of the speed, but also just because of how it originated through the, the team led by Alistair McTaggart, who, who was not a, from the privacy world. Um, and of course it was drafted by more experts than just that, but. Uh, but yeah, the, the combination of that and the speed led to a law that was a little different. The concept of do not sell is also different than, you know, that doesn't exist in the GDPR. Um, it doesn't exist under the FTC's um, frameworks, which are built on the fair information practices. It's kind of a, a bit of a hammer instead of a scalpel, so to speak. Um, yeah, so, I mean, the FTC has an incredible body of work on this. I think people tend to overlook it, but I, I know of many companies, for example, that follow the FTC's frameworks for how to de-identify data. Um, the, the White House under the previous Obama administration was also very involved in publishing the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, for example. Um, and, you know, a lot of companies follow the tea leaves of FTC enforcement actions. So, Enforcement actions and FTC settlements are not intended to be, you know, precedent setting the same way as a judicial decision would be, but people still look at it to read the tea leaves of, well, what does the FTC believe about this? What is this? What does that mean? What is this? There was a, there was a moment um, maybe five years ago when the, the head of the FTC Bureau of Consumer Protection attended a trade conference and said, well, obviously cookie IDs are personal information. And that's obvious to us now, but at the time, 
it, it caused a big disruption. Everyone was like, wait a minute, the FTC thinks cookies are personal information. This is, uh, <laughs> this is totally new. This changes everything about what, what we think about this. Um, so it, it's amazing what you can do with just the limited Section 5 FTC unfairness and deception authority. They've had a major influence on shaping business practices. Mr. Chair. Chair recognizes Delegate Ayala. Hello. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Stacey and Polly, I really appreciate your insights and wisdom. Um, I do think that if we characterize the GDPR and how it's working in Europe, we also have to understand they have baseline standards of law enforcement to really, you know, la a launching platform for privacy, right? They had this, where the United States is, this is a big conversation. Uh, GDPR, as you mentioned earlier on in your presentation, is the gold standard. However, as the United States looks to GDPR regulations or regulatory um, conversations about what legislation may look like, I do believe it's, it's appropriate to contextualize it and say, hey, Europe started with the conversation of Internet of Things and how the data was being collected and how privacy was being addressed with the, these agents. Are we all still here? Yes. You're, For some reason I was getting out and then back in. Um, so I guess, I guess my, my question is, or maybe not a question, is that it, it seems that the US has had a lot of national security concerns over the last four years, um, and rightfully so. And this also includes an underlier of privacy and, and, and security, which is not synonymous always with one another, right? They, they have nuances, but they're not always one and the same. Um, how, you know, when we're talking about implementing, and I see that we're working like Sen like Senator Markey is working on a lot of very similar legislation to implement privacy laws or support. You see that these our states are now here in the United States really taking this issue on. So I guess to the crux of my question, when we look at Virginia, this is not something that everybody has. I, I recognize the apprehension in the conversation around privacy, but I really think that we could be leading the way by taking on some very instructive or instrumental uh, issues um, to include data collection or you know rights to data and what that looks like and how that's defined and so on and so forth. So I'd be really curious to see how you in your in your presentation viewed Virginia and how we ranked in privacy and you know and how you sensed um, just through your uh, mechanics of gathering this information. Um, I don't know if there's a ranking system on privacy. I would love to see one if there isn't, you know, which states are leading those that way and why are they leading and what is working and what is not working. Real time examples of California and um, and to your, to, and I really appreciate your sentiment. We understand why there were some challenges there, but um, would really like to see yeah. how you view Virginia and, and those constructs. I know there was a lot of minutia before. <laughs> Um, no, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I haven't seen anyone giving grades to states on privacy. This is <laughs> where I was coming from. Oh, oh no. I hope I didn't cut you off. I'm sorry. You dropped out and dug it all. Ayala. Um, so, okay. I, I, it, I think I understand the question. I'll try to answer. I haven't seen direct comparisons like that. So California has obviously been a leader, I think the drafting process going on in Washington has been with the benefit of several years of efforts, a very thoughtful and nuanced process. Um, and many other states have, have been in the game too, have been dra drafting laws. And I, I think there's a, an opportunity here for the Commonwealth to, to be a leader on some issues. Um, two things, uh, in terms of sort of ranking of different legislative proposals, the one that's coming to mind for me is uh, EPIC, the Electronic Privacy Information Center, published a, a ranking, a comprehensive ranking of all the different federal proposals. 
So that was pretty interesting. They gave grades to different federal lawmakers on, on their proposals. Um, and the other thing, just sort of uh, food for thought based on your comment about privacy and security, the one of the core useful comments, uh, sorry, concepts that I take out of the GDPR and the EU approach is to dis differentiate between privacy and data protection as related but different core concepts. And in the EU, they actually come from two different enumerated rights in the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, and we think of it as data protection being the rules of the road for handling data. It assumes that collecting data can be a good thing uh, for, for the economy, for research, for public health, uh, for new products and services, and says, if you're gonna handle data, it has to be treated respectfully, it has to be accurate, it has to be relevant to the purposes, um, and it has to be kept secure against unauthorized access and infiltration and disclosure, which is all cybersecurity. Um, that's sort of the world of data protection that we live in. Privacy, on the other hand, we think of as like the shield that an individual can hold up against data collection at all. And in the EU, it comes from the right to private life that there's a sphere of private life that shouldn't be encroached upon that is integral to our autonomy, to our liberty as individuals in the US, to concepts of democracy, right? Um, and privacy often entails uh, concepts of consent. You should be able to, you should have to consent to highly, highly sensitive data being collected about you, to, to invasive profiling, for instance. You should have choices. Um, and be able to say no to certain types of data processing. And uh, in, in my mind, it's very helpful to keep those concepts separate because I think it's very clear in the EU context and then you get over to the US and it's all kind of uh, blended together in various proposals. We see what are really data protection laws being called privacy and vice versa. I don't know if that's helpful, but just food for thought. Okay, just trying to keep my eye on the members and the chat. And I don't see anybody else in the queue, but want to offer that opportunity. Any questions, comments, questions, comments? Okay, uh, not seeing any. I want to certainly thank um, the presentation today by Ms. Gray and Ms. Uh, Sanderson of the Future of Privacy Forum. It's been very, very um, Informative, and I hope it's been helpful to our members. And in the chat as well, uh, there is a link, if you will, to um, their legislative resources. They've been a resource to uh, members of Congress as well as um, many states if they, as they've had these conversations. Um, very, very good conversation today, informative information, um, a flood of information, if you will. <laughs> and that might even be <laughs> a good segue to our next agenda item. Uh, so thank you so much, Ms. Gray, Ms. Sanderson. We really, really appreciate your time. And our next agenda item is that of uh, Mr. John, where is he? Okay, he moved on me. <laughs> I just saw John. There he is, John Goodall, uh, to update us in regards to coastal flooding. Mr. Goodall. Okay, thank you, Delegate Hayes. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Goodall. I'm a faculty member at the University of Virginia. I'm also a co chair of this um, board meeting uh, committee that's working on a study that was um, commissioned um, by the, the Commonwealth. And the topic here is the safety, quality of life and economic consequences of weather and climate related events on coastal areas in Virginia. So my co-chair, um, Antonio Ellis, he updated you guys in July on, on the report. And I'm gonna provide just a, a newer update here today on our progress on um, this study. You go ahead to the next slide. So we, so what we've essentially been um, doing and working on the study is one forming a study board. So um, the way this is being modeled, for those, just to remind you, is um, 
This is being sponsored by the Virginia um, Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, which is an organization within Virginia that's really modeling themselves after the National um, Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. And at the federal level, this, this um, National Academy does a lot of reports and studies for the nation on, on different topics. And um, this Virginia Academy is doing the same thing, but for uh, topics that are, are relevant to the Commonwealth. And so we're modeling ourselves after this national model. And so the first step is to form a study board. And we are actually, we've completed forming that study board. In the next slide, I'll show you kind of the board members um, that are, are part of the board. But we worked on that over the spring and the summer to get it finalized. We've met five times to date as a full board. Um, and um, we've been able to, through those meetings, the virtual meetings, obviously we're being delayed somewhat here with COVID, but we're making progress as well as we can. And so through those board meetings, we've been able to draft out a uh, outline for our report. And I'm gonna show you just very briefly today what that outline looks like and provide a little more detail on kind of the different things we're thinking about in, in writing this report. So you can go ahead to the next slide. So these are the board members. These are, uh, we think, experts in this in the Commonwealth here thinking about this issue of um, flooding and climate change within kind of coastal communities in Virginia. Lots of experience on the topic, and we're really excited to have this uh, this number of people kind of commit to the to the study and the report. So um, I won't name everybody here. Just give you a moment to look through the list. Um, and we have we we formed the the, the board thinking about experts from um, a, the um, universities here in Virginia. So we have UVA, Virginia Tech, GMU, uh, VCU, ODU, William Mary, all represented on the board, but also folks um, in industry and um, those with um, um, kind of experience. Um, thinking about this from a, a governmental perspective, economic perspective, law perspective, so trying to cover all of our bases and informing the board. So we we have a lot of expertise in the board. So we are we're really working on this study um, among the board members primarily. We have some resources from past presentations to this committee, and and we also have contacts with other experts that we may call in for testimony to fill out the the uh, report more so, but we're at this point really thinking that a lot of the expertise is within this board that we've been able to assemble. If you go on to the next slide. So just a very high level of what this report we're, we're drafting, um, we're anticipating it will look like, and I can kind of just walk through this briefly. If anyone's interested in more details, I'm happy to share a more detailed outline of what the report's shaping up to look like. Um, if that's of interest to you, but I thought I'd just keep it brief here today for this update. First, we want to have an introduction and we want to explicitly kind of call out the, ch the climate change um, problem that's facing Virginia. We want to uh, make it clear how this is already impacting our coastal communities. Uh, we want to make the point that coastal communities is actually a, a a broader term here in Virginia, lots of communities that aren't directly on the coast are going to be impacted by this as well, just from um, sea level and, and tide levels reaching far in for coastal rivers all the way up into northern Virginia, for example, in the Potomac, but also um, a lot of services depend on our coastal community, um, the shipping and agriculture. So we're going to kind of make that point clear within the introduction of the report. We want to really, the next section will be on current impacts. Something we're hearing consistently on the board is this is not a, a far off problem. This is a current problem uh, that's impacting both uh, rural and urban communities within the coast, coastal areas of Virginia. We want to make those um, stories known. So we want to highlight some of the impacts that are happening right now to make people aware of them if they haven't heard them yet. Um, and to also emphasize there are ideas and projects that are ready to go in terms of helping helping out these communities as they try to 
understand the impacts um, of the sea level rise and, and climate change. Um, then we wanna pivot to just laying out what our best understanding of the future will look like um, with three different timelines. And this is language from the bill, but near, medium and long-term impacts. Um, so near-term meaning within the next few years, long-term meaning more kind of a decade perspective, maybe out to mid-century or a little bit beyond. Within the timeline of major infrastructure projects might happen. Um, and so we want to, to paint that picture for both the uh, urban communities on the coast and the rural communities. We feel like those the problems facing these communities are somewhat different and need to be um, highlighted in different sections within the report. Um, the, the challenges, the impacts, but the opportunities as well for, for having impact within those communities. So this will be our best understanding based on science, based on projections. Uh, we'll acknowledge that you know, there's uncertainty in these projections, of course, but there's pretty good consensus that these impacts will happen there's some debate in terms of how quickly they will happen. So we wanna make that point clear within the report. The last section we're gonna um, include in this report, which we think will be helpful for this committee and others, is perspectives on decision-making. So there are a lot of challenging ways to think about this um, issue. And as a, as a board, we've kind of spent most of our time actually thinking about this section of the report. What are these difficult, challenging questions that we'll be, um, we'll be needing to face. What are the trade-offs? What are the benefits? How should efforts be focused? Um, so we're gonna uh, have a, a number of different points within this last section that we, help, we hope will be helpful in thinking about decision-making around this, this question of sea level rise and flooding impacts. All right, so if you go to the next slide. This is my last slide, um, just to give you an idea of where we're moving forward as, as a study committee. So we um, have really completed this outline, um, at least an initial draft of the outline. And now we're tasking board members with writing certain sections of the report. And we'll be doing that over, over the next few months. We uh, may be in the spring, we will be um, having experts come in and interview as we feel like we have gaps in knowledge within the board that we need to fill in. Uh, we'll uh, reach out to experts to include them, their testimony within the report. Um, so those, those board meetings will continue within the spring. Talking um, with uh, Dave Barry earlier, we, we were kind of thinking about the timeline here because originally our final report was gonna be due in November, but with COVID and, and um, just transitioning to a, a virtual format, it's been delayed. So we're anticipating wrapping this up in the spring ne next year in May, uh, 2021, delivering the final report to, to JCOT. So that's our, our plan goal at this, at, at this point. So that's what I wanted to, to share in terms of an update for the study. I'd be happy to um, answer any questions if there's time. Mr. Chair, I believe your mic is muted. Thanks so much, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Goodall, uh, for that uh, update, if you will, and certainly uh, informative and very thorough, uh, allowing us to know exactly where you are in your planning. Um, members, questions or comments? Okay, I'm not seeing any, not in the chat or on my screen. Uh, Mr. Goodall, we certainly appreciate it. And uh, to the members, uh, this is a very important issue. And I think one of the things that really stuck out for me as he was providing that update is the fact that um, this is an issue in urban areas of the, of the Commonwealth as well as rural areas um, and that it's a real issue that we're going to have to uh, grapple with and deal with. Um, and so we certainly look forward uh, to the report, Mr. Goodall, and we await with anticipation to see what is included in the report. Uh, thank you so much. 
uh, members, last round, any words, comments, questions? Okay, seeing none, um, then that concludes the agenda that we had uh, for today. And um, not having or seeing any other information for the good of the order, then the committee will rise. Thank you.